Okay, I'd like to bring up two of the giants on our side of the aisle, two amazing ad makers, Jim Nicenzi and Larry McCarthy. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Linda since the late 1970s, early 1980s. And I'm here to say I would not be standing here today without Linda Duvall. What she did and has done and continues to do for women in this industry is amazing. So I'm here to say thank you, madam. Larry? I spent a lot of time looking for some funny lines about pollsters. There aren't any. Uh, the closest line that I could come up with was said by a noted political scientist, and she said, polls are only useful for two things, cross-country skiers and strippers. Unlike virtually all of you, I was actually in campaign meetings in the 1970s, and I can tell you that there were very, very few women in the room. Um, the women that I remember on the GOP side from campaigns in the 70s and the 80s, you could measure on less than a handful, um, which really, I think, puts Linda's accomplishments in even even a higher plane, because she not only cracked the glass ceiling for women, GOP women in campaigns, she just shattered it through the roof. Uh, it was a tough, tough business. Uh, she started with very little, because in those days there were basically two or three big GOP media firms and three or four GOP polling firms, and she shattered the glass ceiling, she shattered the industry, and she blazed a path which female political operatives are enjoying today. So I think it's only appropriate that Linda get this award tonight. Wow, Larry, I didn't realize we were going to tell jokes. So this Irish couple goes to Cape Cod, and um, they're out there. I guess I can't tell that joke. Okay. Everybody having a good time tonight. Free booze all night long right here. Becky Donatelli is going to pick up the tab. All right, so here's a question for you. Anybody play golf? I can't see you, but just let me hear. Anybody play golf? Yeah, okay, it's a great sport, right? Golf is one of the hardest sports in the world. And the reason it is because of the is between your ears. Golf takes confidence, so much confidence. And as Larry said, Linda Duvall had a choice. She was a world-class golfer, and she could have played professional golf. She was that good. She could stand over a golf ball and put it in the hole. And let me tell you something. When you're playing at the level she played in, I think she's had a couple of championships in Virginia. She's a senior women's amateur champ. I mean, it takes a lot of confidence. So I'm going to tell you something else about Linda. I asked her the other day, Linda, if you had a billboard, everybody in the world could see it, what would your message be and why? This is what she told me. Believe in yourself and inspire others. God, isn't that beautiful? Because you have to believe in yourself. When you come to Washington, D.C. in the 70s and the Republican Party is a bunch of old white guys from the country clubs and nobody's saying they're a Republican, what part are you from? We're a Republican, right? Nobody wants to know because of Richard Nixon. And here comes Linda Duvall. And as Larry said, she broke all the ceilings. She broke and shattered them. She shattered those glass ceilings. And so today... She has inspired an awful lot of us. What's really cool is that Linda is the first female pollster in the AAPC Hall of Fame. She has shattered another, another thing. It's really cool, isn't it? All right, so 
I'm not going to, you didn't give me a microphone. I can talk forever. I can, my wife says I can talk to a stop sign, so I'm not going to do this. Um, but Linda, there are a few of your friends that had some wonderful things to say about you. So uh, without ado, here are some things from your friends. Linda, congratulations on being named in the Hall of Fame for uh, the American Association of Political Consultants. Well deserved. You've come a long way, Linda, from that freshly minted college student in 1975 to the skillful pollster and business owner who we honored tonight. I'm so excited to participate tonight to pay tribute to the amazing career of my friend Linda Duvall. You know, it's been decades and decades and decades and decades of hard, smart work. The first time I saw Linda, I was in a campaign manager school in 1980. She came to teach us about uh, survey research. It was so exciting. I got to know Linda when I first ran for Congress in 2014. Linda and I have shared a friendship for more than 45 years. She came to the Republican National Committee in, in 1974. Linda was the first, not just the, uh, you know, not just the first woman, the first everything, including our first in our generation to start her own firm. When Linda Duvall started her company, not many women uh, were supposed to be running big, major national polling companies, but Linda did. Uh, Linda's done a great job. She was a pioneer in the field of survey research. She was a pioneer for women. She was a pioneer in building her own business. For the past 19 years, I've gotten to see firsthand what a true trailblazer Linda is. Beyond Linda's golf swing, one of her greatest traits is her ability to let others grow within the firm. Linda, you're a badass, and you don't care who knows it. You have spent your career putting your clients ahead of your paycheck, ahead of your career considerations, and ahead of doing what's easy. You've always done what's right. Linda, you and your charts, and your relentless focus on the suburban voter, and the gender gap paved the way for early special election victories and the many elections to come. Linda, anyone who has ever worked with you uh, is so proud of your accomplishments and the integrity with which you approached your work. I want to know what she thought. As it turned out, I never had to ask because she was always willing to tell me exactly what she thought. And the one thing that I always admired the most was she was never afraid to tell truth to power. You've never been afraid to stand up and tell it like it is and to take on the powers that be. One of the things about Linda, she chose politics over being a professional golfer, but she brought the same competitive spirit that a professional golfer would have to her political work as well. She's also the only pollster who could outdrive Dan Quayle in a contest for the longest drive. That, my friends, is the range of skills that makes Linda Duvall a Hall of Famer in anything she does. Well, I am grateful to look up to Linda as a role model, to have her as an incredible part of my team, to ensure that my constituents get the best public service that they deserve, representing New York's 21st District. I'm thankful for you. I'm proud to call you a friend. I'm proud to call you a mentor. I can truly say there's been no greater mentor I've ever had and no better partner I could ask for than Linda. Any success I've had in the past or will have in the future and the success of the American Viewpoint overall is really attributed to what we've all learned from Linda. You are indeed the real deal. Congratulations on a lifetime of achievement and this award. Congratulations on a spectacular career and uh, let's get that golf game going. Congratulations, Linda. Well deserved. Linda, congratulations on a well-deserved recognition uh, for a great career, and I hope there's still more of it to come. Linda, from all of us at American Viewpoint, congratulations on your well-deserved induction into the AAPC Hall of Fame. And now, my only question is, your golf course or mine? La ladies and gentlemen, the 2021 Hall of Fame, Miss Linda Duvall. Come on up, kid. Break into the ceiling.
Let's give this, her this one. This one. Give her this one. Right here. You don't get to take it home or ship it okay. to you. Thank you. Go for it. Wow. <laughs> I am uh, overwhelmed with that, uh, that video tribute and uh, this honor this evening. I want to thank Jim and Asunzi for being the uh, executive producer and director of this film. <laughs> I want to thank, uh, I thank all my friends for their contributions. And if I ever thought it was surprising to anybody that I played golf, I now know my clients and everybody knew about that all along. Um, I just have to say that, first of all, to, to Becky's point, here we are 18 months from when the ceremony was originally scheduled, and I guess this is for real, right? Um, to, have a, to actually have a Lifetime Achievement Award was not something I ever expected to achieve. And the fact that Maricopa County and Fulton County results remain unchanged, I guess means that this is not a fraudulent election, and so we can proceed with the certification process. I want to thank the American Association of Political Consultants for so many things. One, for doing so much early on to legitimize the political consulting community. We are a business, and all of us in this room work very hard, give up family, give up a lot of time to do things that we really like to pursue, like my new passion is now pickleball. Um, <laughs> But the APC has legitimized this industry, and it's really cool to see so many young people kind of set their path in saying they want to get recognized. Neil Newhouse's son, Tom Newhouse, just got an award last night, which is pretty cool to see another generation of talent um, in the pipeline here. And to thank Becky Donatelli for her years as president of this organization, and Jim Anasenzi for their faith in me and recognition for this award. Um, but I have to say, this award is not just for me. It's a lifetime of support, encouragement, opportunity, and advancement from so many people. Uh, to my mentors, Wilma Goldstein and Bob Teeter, who taught me so much about survey research, analysis, and common sense. And to my dad, Bob Duvall, who passed along his love of numbers to me. My dad was a CPA and a Fortune 500 CFO. And he always said to me that nobody could ever challenge the numbers. And so that's why I picked survey research. Nobody would challenge the numbers, right? I yearn for that era in time. <laughs> to Joe Gaylord, Chairman Bill Brock of the RNC, Charlie Black, Eddie Mai, Congressman Guy Vanderjack, Chairman of the NRCC, Steve Stockmeyer, Nancy Dwight, who you heard give a video segment there, they ran two national committees that basically fostered the spirit and culture of entrepreneurism that has inspired so many of us to pursue their dream. Neil Newhouse, Bill McInturf, Ed Goas, all of us were in that laboratory. Jim Innocenzi, we all started firms based on that experience we had at the NRCC and the RNC. It's a really cool place to be at a young age, have that air travel card and go wherever you wanted and just get back on time, except that one time when Neil and I made a detour to Mount Snow. Um, and we had a suntan, but we had to explain that down the road. Um, <laughs> Bob Teeter, Dick Worthland, Lance Terrence, Arthur Finkelstein, Dottie Lynch, they all passed along their wisdom to me. All I had to do was listen, watch, and learn. One day, Bob Teeter, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life after 1984 at the NRCC, and Bob Teeter offered me the opportunity to um, join him at MOR, but I had to move to Detroit. I'm like, why do I have to go to Detroit? What am I gonna learn in Detroit? So I decided at age 32 in 1985 that I was going to stay in DC and become the first female Republican to start my own survey research firm. I didn't know as much as I knew as I now know. I probably wouldn't have done it if I had been through this experience I have for the last 36 years. But it was an agonizing decision and I had the support in terms of moral encouragement and financial support from my parents, my sister's father-in-law, and the Heiler family. And the rest, as they say, is history but it has been an amazing journey. What's really cool about all this coming back to Las Vegas is my career started here in Nevada. In 1974, Mary Louise Smith became chairman of the Republican National Committee, succeeding whom? George Herbert Walker Bush. 
Mary Louise Smith decided that she wanted people to go out to campaigns. A novel thought, right? I think there were maybe 90 employees of the RNC. I think the last election cycle there were over 400. So she asked for volunteers. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I just graduated from Arizona State University. I was like ready to go. I got assigned to Nevada. I'm like, how much cooler can it be than that? And Eddie Mai said to me, you're going to go do tracking. I said, what does that mean? Do I go run around the block? So they sent me to Claremont College to learn how to do tracking. And um, I headed out here to, uh, actually flew in Reno, met with Barbara Vukanovich, who was Paul Laxalt's uh, campaign manager. I stayed at the Ormsby Hotel and Casino in Carson City. I'm 22 years old. This is nothing but fun. I've got an air travel card, a phone card, a rental car, and uh, away I go. So I didn't really know that much about polling then, I hate to say. But, you know, I, I was trained, and so I did what I could. And my results were compared to a certain casino here in Las Vegas. And when my results matched the casino's result, the Laxalt people had faith in me that I knew what I was doing. The one thing I didn't understand was not only was I supposed to mail the results in. I mean, there was no fax machine. machine. There were no cell phones. So I actually just mailed the results in with a little handwritten note. And, you know, I come to Las Vegas one day, I think I hear my name page at the airport. I'm like, that's ridiculous, nobody knows me. Check in the hotel, Linda Duvall, please call your office. I'm like, what? Well, I get to my room and Eddie Mai is calling me and he's screaming, bloody murder. What the hell, Duvalli, where are those results? And um, nobody told me I was supposed to call him. How was I to know that? Um, so the, the Laxall campaign, you might remember, he ran against a certain guy named Harry Reid. And uh, Howard Hughes was also slightly an issue, and President Ford was also slightly an issue. And so these were things we got to test in survey research. And we immediately knew that the closest we wanted President Ford to the state of Nevada was 30,000 feet in the air directly over the state flying somewhere else. And uh, election day came, I showed that we would win narrowly, and uh, Virginia City and Story County results were still out. And we kept calling them to say, where are your results? And they said, well, you know, the, the ballots are here on the pool table, but right now we're drinking and we're not going to get to it tonight. <laughs> like, well, and, you know, Laxalt's brother, John, said, well, what do you mean you're not going to get to it tonight? Well, we'll get to it tomorrow, John. We're just kind of not really feeling that confident about our ability to count these votes right now. <laughs> so uh, the next morning, you know, the results finally were, were tallied and uh, Paul Laxalt won by 640 votes. So that was a, a pretty cool experience. And I said, well, if you could have that much impact as a pollster to direct presidential travel, assess the impact of Howard Hughes, which was frankly positive to our swing voters because it meant jobs for the state of Nevada. I said, that's where I wanted to be. So it's um, with immense pride that I accept this honor and think back to the many wonderful things that occurred during my career running American Viewpoint. I mean, working alongside Newt Gingrich and Joe Gaylord and, and pollsters, Neil Newhouse, Bill McIntyre, Ed Goas, Dave Sackett, Glenn Bolger, Brian Tagali, and David Winston, in uh, realizing Newt's dream of taking over the, the GOP, taking over the House of Representatives for the GOP. Um, I mean, you have to give Newt a lot of credit. He just spurred all of us on to think big thoughts, um, to really dream big and make this happen. And um, I have an appreciation for so many people. You heard Roy Blunt talk. He was uh, not my first client. Nancy Johnson and Bill Emerson from Missouri were my first clients. And from Bill Emerson, I was introduced to Roy Blunt. But in 1990, two individuals decided to run for governor in their states, Roy Blunt and Johnny Isaacson. They both lost, um, but they stood by me, and they went on to run for the House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate, and they hired American Viewpoint. And uh, we've been the pollster for the Blunt family in, in so many contests. I mean, they are like family to us. Uh, being, as, being selected as the pollster for Senator Richard Luger, Phil Graham, Fred Thompson, Kelly Ayotte, Sonny Bono, that was a blast. Newt, Elise Tilly Fowler, Elizabeth Dole, George Bush, Mitt Romney, John McCain, John Porter, Sherry Bullard, uh, Mike Braun, Mike Oxley, Congress, or Governor Brian Kemp right now. They all reveal a common denominator that across the ideological spectrum, our clients recognize the quality research that they will receive from American Viewpoint. And as Randy and others have said, the candid assessment and the strategic direction that we provide them and realize that American Viewpoint has an unparalleled reputation for integrity, quality control, and going the distance for our clients and realizing their objectives. The one thing I've always passed along to anyone who's part of the American Viewpoint team is this. Our name is not on the ballot. 
our client's name is on the ballot. And we need to move heaven and earth to make sure that they get elected and we deliver to them the most candid assessment that we can of where they are. This is not about, not about making us feel good. It is about looking at the data and understanding what can be done to change the equation for them to win. And so at the end of the day, we need to answer this one question. Did I do everything in my power to provide quality data and strategic perspective that will make a difference to our client, to our client in achieving victory and accomplishing their objectives? This industry has not been without its challenges. And again, AAPC has been helpful. Republicans and Democrat pollsters together have worked over the years to try to resolve some of the problems that we face. Our industry has faced some threats. Obviously, you know what they are. We've got uh, increased cell phone usage, block calls, a pandemic, ranked ballot choice voting for crying out loud, early voting, mail-in voting, election day shenanigans in certain states. All these things present problems. But we work through that. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that. Just go back to the old days when I was with Bill Brock at the RNC. You, you could make three calls to get one completed interview. You know what it is today? About 200. In states like Georgia, Maine, and New Hampshire, we have so many different races going on at the same time that are targeted by so many different entities. It could be 300 interviews at one time. So the goal of obtaining a representative sample is always the key challenge. But it's something that both sides of the aisle work very closely to adhere to and try to advance their technique. The most important challenge today, in my mind, is a threat to our democracy that attempts to undermine our privilege to vote and support candidates that we want to represent us and showcase our American way of life and democracy. Candidate recruitment, in my mind, is the most critical thing. Who wants to run for office today? It's up to us in this room to identify those unique individuals, to, to provide our energy, our insight, our experience and our dedication to making those stellar candidates stand out and get elected because that's how our democracy will survive. On a lighter side, as some of you know, I used to uh, be a consultant for CBS News. And uh, working with Leslie Stahl, Connie Chun, Ed Bradley, Bob Schieffer, and Dan Rather was interesting. And I was always asked, well, did you ever experience any bias as a Republican from anybody at CBS News? So let me share with you two short stories. One, in 2000, Harrison, and Hick Harrison Hickman and I were the consultants for Dan Rather. Now, we go through dress rehearsals at CBS. You have the Friday night rehearsal, then you have the Saturday night rehearsal. They are torture. It goes from 8 p.m. to maybe midnight. And uh, obviously the consultants are you know, they're on their game. They want to demonstrate why their side will win. And as some of you may know, I'm a little bit competitive. So I kind of relished this time. And so I had, like, a Gillespie and Carl Rove on my speed dial. If, you know, Dan or, or Bob wanted to talk to them about Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, or New Hampshire. Yeah, they weren't that interested. At the end of the evening, and this evening is basically designed so that all the reporters and the anchors and all the producers will understand any eventuality that occur on election day and kind of move with that um, and respond quickly. So at the end of the evening, Dan shouted out to me across the anchor desk, Linda, how do you think we did tonight? And my response was, you might want to practice a George W. Bush win tomorrow night. It was all about Al Gore winning. And um, I just didn't see that happening. Now then again, nothing could have prepared us for what actually happened that night. But <laughs> The other interesting story I have is in 2002, Randy Gutermuth and I were the pollsters for Jim Talent in Missouri, who was challenging Gene Carnahan for the U.S. Senate seat. Randy was at headquarters in St. Louis. I was in New York City with Dan Rather. Um, the news was, or the election night coverage was going to end when David Letterman came on the air. So, like 11.30, we were gonna be off the air. And um, I, Randy had really said to everybody in the, in the blunt campaign, or in the uh, Talent campaign, you know, they're going to hold the results in St. Louis City until they see what's going on in the rest of the state. And sure enough, the, the returns were slow enough, very slow coming in. So the campaign wanted a call to be made. CBS was having nothing of that. I looked at the clock and I realized we had two minutes left to make the call live while CBS election night was still on the air. I had the phone to my ear and Randy comes on and he goes, listen to what they're saying here on local television. 
in Missouri. And I hear the words, I said, Dan, come here. Gene Carnahan has just conceded the election to Jim Talent. I said, Dan, do you think we can make the call now? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, certain things like that, you have to hold your ground and you have to have the courage to say, you know, what you think, even though it might uh, go against some of the protocol that is going on at that particular network. Anyhow, the media experience was always fun. Uh, the one that was probably the hardest for me personally was doing a hardball with Chris Matthews, because every time he called me to go on the air, I would develop an instant migraine headache. Um, he always had too many guests. He had no interest in talking to you. It was just about his own monologue, exactly like another morning show on MSNBC. Um, but he called me to be on the air the night that Elizabeth Dole dropped out of the race, and I was her pollster, so I decided to um, accept his invitation. And he went on his monologue, and he actually said to me, Linda, I'll tell you one reason that Elizabeth Dole is dropping out of this race. It's because she refused to do network shows and never appeared on this show. I was astounded. Uh, but not too astounded to simply state, Chris, I'm not aware that he have to come on hardball as a prerequisite to being elected president of the United States. Well, Michael Barone was in the green room. He was the next guest, and he looked at me with a big laugh. He goes, Linda, that was great, but you'll never be invited back to this show. <laughs> and he was right. So well, I've accomplished a lot of my career, um, you know, creating the time and decision making model uh, that led to the 72 hour program, our own darts that we use internally that our consultants love to look at, the scene read or heard and the verbatim comments. We could go on for hours about our, our favorite verbatim of the day during the tracking season. I'm sure Neil at POS has some of the same experiences. But the thing that I really admit the proudest of in my over 36 years in this business are two things. One, the friendships and relationships I've developed. I mean, Neil and Bill, you know, we've, we've grown up together in this business. Neil and I and Ed Goas used to play cutthroat racquetball. And if anybody, you know, went home with, you know, not some bodily injury, there was something wrong. Um, Neil and I actually had knee surgery together and his wife took care of us both at the same time <laughs> um, from racquetball injuries. Um, but my greatest, my greatest accomplishment has been in hiring people who are smarter than me to be become a part of the American Viewpoint team. Um, through my dad and Lee Thurow, we implemented a profit sharing plan for our employees in addition to a bonus system because we all want to realize our success together. It's not one person or two people that makes it happen. It's an entire team. And as with any company, there is or should be an evolution in leadership and staffing. Randall Gutermer joined American Viewpoint in 2000. He is now our CEO and president the undisputed leader of our team. Randy has the hardest work ethic of anyone I know. And the standards are exactly what I wanted in someone to succeed me in raising the bar on integrity, quality control standards, candidate analysis, and strategic insight in meeting the challenges of our industry. He is one of the pollsters who is constantly at the table when they talk about what are the challenges facing the industry and what are we prepared to do next. And he always has solutions to those particular problems. With Randy at the helm, our post-election planning process has become exhaustive reviews of business practices, refinements to the process that pushes us to the higher goals of achievement. Randy is the pollster for leader Kevin McCarthy in designing strategies to take over the House of Representatives. I named the company American Viewpoint for a reason. First of all, nobody knew who Linda Duvall was, so that was pretty simple. Uh, but second, Having a company starting with A puts you at the start of the alphabet and the start of, in the old days, all the written material. So I kind of figured out Duval & Associates was not a, a business model that was going to succeed. But our business is thriving, growing with a new generation of talent um, as we head into the future. We brought Andy Blunt in to be the Director of Strategic Development. Josh Davidson is our Vice President. Sean O'Donnell is our Chief Technology Officer, who we literally ran out into the street to bring back after we let him go after his first interview. And I said, Randy, we cannot let this guy go. I'm literally running down the street trying to chase Sean to get him back in the office to hire him. Abby Hendricks has a fancy title of being Research Director. I basically call her our air traffic controller. She makes things flow without interruption. Randy and I will sometimes have a plan of how we want things to go. Well, usually it's Abby who says how things are going to go and she rarely allows us to get in her way of that plan of action. She's an incredible behind the scenes player who's been my right hand person in all of my races. And then there is Celia Starr. Where would I be, where would American Viewpoint be without her? 
She takes on every mission, the most important, of course, being collecting the revenue and generating invoices and keeping track of our historical financial analysis. She's part of my life who has lessened my stress level considerably. We have a number of new people to American Viewpoint that are here with us tonight. Sage Davis, Mary Taylor, uh, Stephen Selleck, who's back home. Um, and we also have a person who's been my longest friend in political life, and that's Bob Dahl. He's a member of our board of directors at American Viewpoint. We have way too many stories we could tell you about bad things we did in Fort Worth, Texas together when we worked for a certain really kind of creepy bad guy who had a public affairs company, but we were desperate to get out on the road and steal yard signs, which we almost got arrested for. Uh, but um, I was director of polling, Bob was running four congressional races, and I was doing survey research when the phones were cut down because the owner had not paid the phone bill. So that was a little bit embarrassing. Uh, to my friend Nancy Duncan being by my side, and even as a Democrat, understanding the, the stress, challenges, and exhilaration of my career over the years, and putting up with my sometimes impatient attitude during tough campaign times, and usually my impatient attitude every day. Um, I'd like to thank my family. My mom and dad aren't here, but um, they encouraged me to, to undertake my dream of starting my own company. And without their financial support, um, we would not be here today. So to the American Association of Political Consultants, again, thank you for what you do in recognizing the stars of the consulting industry and recognizing me with this Lifetime Achievement Award. It is meaningful and quite rewarding and the tribute to Ross Bates was also quite inspiring. And thank you for introducing that to all of us. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.